Okay, so hi, good afternoon and welcome. It's really nice to see lots of people here. We're here today to hear from three young women about what it means to be a young woman in the classroom and not only in the classroom but in the playground and in the corridors and in school and the issues that are facing young women today and some of the ways that people are challenging them. So we're going to hear from today in a uh, I'm going to introduce them in reverse age order. We have Myla on the end, who's 11, who's a student at Marylebone School for Girls, uh, and who I think she's going to tell us is very excited to be here because she attended well last year and really enjoyed it. We have Anissa, who's a student at Mulberry School for Girls, who is 15. Uh, and we have Yaz, who's a student at uh, Mixed Sixth Form College, Woodhouse, and who is 17. I'm going to be chairing, uh, my name is Miriam Franklin, and I'm a teacher at Mulberry School for Girls. So, first of all, I'd really like to hear from Yaz on what, you know, what she has to say on the issue of feminism in the classroom. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, I, just, um, I just want to introduce myself quickly first. Um, I'm a... I've been involved in activism since I was about 15. Uh, I think I had a lot of feminist thoughts before then, but I didn't really know what the word was, and I, I come to identify with it when I was 15 years old. I started a blog, uh, I was writing about it, and uh, I, got, um, I got really interested in media sexism um, in particular, and uh, how that impacts on young women. So I got involved with the No More Page 3 campaign, and then afterwards, I, I started a campaign for better sex education alongside The Telegraph, um, looking at um, putting violence towards women um, and the influence of digital media, so online pornography, sexting, um, onto the curriculum. And um, recently, um, new guidance has actually been written, um, so the curriculum is going to be updated, which is quite cool. Um, <laughs> Um, and I think what re what's really influenced a lot of my campaigning is personal experience, talking to other young women um, in a school environment and actually seeing the extent of sexual harassment that happens in schools um, and sort of the commonplace nature of it. The idea that when a girl is, is groped or sexually harassed or... Um, bullied verbally um, she she just feels that this is the norm and that she has no right to speak about this because this is just what happens to girls um, and I think that's a real problem in our culture because young girls feel like that and young boys a lot of the time feel that it's the norm as well um, to take out those actions that just trying to fit in maybe um, and it's a real problem and it's a real cultural problem and it's not something that we can tackle in schools alone it's something that's going to have to sweep across the entire media it's something that's going to have to happen on every level so that we can finally achieve um, that security in schools that um, that young women deserve um, so. Yeah, just quickly before we hear from Myla, um, I just want to pick up on something you said about you're really inspired by personal experience of kind of sexual harassment, sexual bullying in schools. How widespread do you that problem do you think it is in your experience? I think it's it's really widespread. I mean, I have personal because I was sexually assaulted. It wasn't a really serious sexual assault, but it happened in a classroom environment when I was 12 years old, and as you can imagine. I mean, it would be really, really shocking now, but at 12 especially, it was really horrific, and it really, sh it really shook me when it happened. Um, and I've seen it happen to a lot of my friends. Um, I, I, I talk to my friends a lot of the time, and they don't feel like they can talk about it. And then when you ask that question, it's like sort of a relief um, to be able to talk to somebody about it, but they would never open that conversation themselves because they don't feel like it's something that they can discuss or they, um, they're almost, they feel like it's something they're not allowed to discuss even though nobody's deliberately stopping them. Okay. Thank you very much for you know, speaking to us. Myla, would you like to speak first? Yeah. Um, hi guys, my name's Mila. 
and I am really, really interested in feminism, and I'm a feminist. I'm, I don't think I've been as, like, involved as th these other people, but obviously, because I'm quite young, I haven't had the chance. Like, in primary school, um, they didn't teach us about feminism, and I think that's quite sad, because people, I'm in year seven now, and when I ask them, like, when I talk about feminism, they have no idea what I'm talking about, and, um, I just think I just really I'm really interested in like social media and anorexia and how social media is kind of like is not really helping to stop this horrible mental illness and um, there are even sites promoting anorexia and telling you how to get thinner like sucking on an ice cube while if you're hungry or peeing or hurting yourself if you're hungry and I, it's just really unacceptable and it should not be happening. And um, also Instagram, sites like Instagram, I'm on Instagram and I love Instagram and it's great for creativity but it's also a really good, it's a really hard place because um, it's quite easy to be cyber bullied about your appearance and I think it's not acceptable, acceptable for girls to feel that way and um, also I have some facts about anorexia, the mortality rate associated with anorexia is 12 times higher than the death rate associated with all causes of death for all females from 15 to 24 years old and women are actually much more likely than men to develop an eating disorder and only an estimated 5 to 15 percent um, of people with anorexia or bulimia are male and it's just, it's just a horrible thought that people think about themselves that way. And recently at my school, it was um, obviously on Friday, it was Women of the World Day. And because my school's a girls' school, we like to celebrate like they were all united. And like, I dressed up as Pippi Longstocking, she's one of my idols, because she was the first feminist. Um, original like book character and she was like she was strong and she was the strongest girl in the world and she saved herself unlike fairy tale characters and um, but no one really knew who she was and it was really it was really I found it quite bad that like people my age don't know about feminism and so I was dressing up as her and people kept on asking her how who I was and they kept on staring at me like I was a weirdo just because <laughs> I dressed up as someone I believe in and they they kept saying how is she feminist and I was like well she's the first feminist book character and I thought it was quite an original idea and I was really happy with myself for that so yeah. <laughs> very much. I, mean, I think I'm not the only person who's going to go home and dig out my copy of Pippi Longstocking now. <laughs> um, can I hear now, please, from Anissa? Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Anissa, and I go to Mulberry School for Girls. I think I'm so fortunate to go to such an amazing school because from the first day I was there, I was taught that you're strong and you're perfect, you know, and sort of you need to show that. And I think it's just such an amazing thing to be taught and sort of you feel so empowered by it. And my view on feminism, I think, has really changed and sort of moulded throughout the years. I think the first time I called myself a feminist was December 2012, um, <laughs> to be sort of precise. And I was, um, it was my, sorry about that, I'm really clumsy. And so it was my first Modern United Nations conference, thank you. And the theme was gender equality and sort of what countries need to be doing to get gender equality. So for like... I'm sure many of you don't know what Modi United Modi UN is. It's basically schools modelling the UN, and you become an ambassador for a country, and you study current world affairs and sort of global issues and how to overcome it. And I was thinking, why is it that in Britain you don't hear of things like sort of female genital mutilation and women that work 18 hours on a farm and then come home and are sexually harassed and stuff? And I thought, well, I'm so fortunate to live where I am and. It's disgusting the things that are going on in the world and sort of what women have to go through. And then I thought, what would I, what would I describe that as? And I thought, equality, feminism. And I think it just, 
from feminism I got equality and that's not just for men and women but for children for grown-ups for animals I think everybody deserves to be in a place where they feel safe and feel as though their voice is being heard so I think the word feminism is so it's so I feel so deeply rooted to it because it's something I definitely believe in and I think we need to feel safe and we need to feel so sort of open with who we are and so I think saying perfection is out of there I don't believe it because everyone has their own thing of idea of perfection and I think equality is perfection so that's all <laughs> Very much. Um, I just want to start by picking up on, we're well, talking really about the F word, because all three of you called yourselves feminists in your speeches. Um, and I wanted to know, how easy is it to call yourself a feminist in, in school in 2014? Is that something that most young women do, or is it something that puts you in a minority amongst your peers? Um, I think that um, it's a lot easier than it was, like, a f like a few years ago even but um, a lot of my friends um, only about a few of my friends uh, call themselves feminist and as I was saying before pe a lot of people don't know in my, in my um, year what feminism is and yeah that's yeah <laughs> Thank you. Yes? I think I'm going to come from a different viewpoint um, because I go to a mixed school um, and I, I went to a mixed school I go to a college now um, and I've always been mixed amongst boys and girls. Um, and I think it's definitely a lot more difficult um, for boys to acknowledge <laughs> that you're a feminist. I think they react a lot more negatively to it. I think there are girls who react very negatively as well. Um, and I'm speaking from personal experience. Um, but it's, it's predominantly been boys who have acted quite negatively towards it. And I think a lot of people... Um, I think a lot of people, even girls who are in support of you being a feminist, will only come out and say it very quietly, um, but not publicly, um, just kind of in the corner like, yeah, um, I, kind of, I kind of agree with that as well. But um, it's just, it's because you do receive a lot of backlash and a lot of and what even sort of bullying. Backlash do you mean? Um, a lot of name calling, um, sexual harassment. And uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say something quite controversial here, but a couple years ago, um, I put a picture of my armpit hair on Facebook. And I know I'm perpetuating the stereotype, right? But um, I wanted to do it because I wanted to gorge a reaction. I wanted to see, I, I, I wanted to show to other students how people would react. Because a lot of the, the argument that a lot of people have is men and women are equal now, we're in a post-feminist era. Um, there's no need for you to fight for equality. So I said, okay, I'm gonna put a picture of my hair on Facebook, and if you saw a guy's hair on Facebook, you wouldn't react at all. But if you see me with hair on Facebook, what's gonna happen? And t I got tons of backlash from it online, and I got a guy who followed me around the school with his armpits up all the time, <laughs> and he would follow me down the corridors, and my poor sister, who's sitting in the audience, had loads of people come up to her and ask her about it when it has nothing to do with her. Um, and it just kind of, a lot of people who had said, there's no sexism, actually come up to me and went, actually, you know what? This is going on and it's out of order. And yeah, I thought that was, Kind of proof. Yes. So, one thing that's quite interesting to me listening to your talks is, is yeah, as I'm quite shocked as you talk about serious sexual harassment in school, that, you, that this is something that is sort of seems to be allowed to go unchecked in your school. And you mentioned, Anissa, you know, how supportive Mulberry is, and I want to come back to that. But, Yaz, can you talk a little bit about? What your, in what way, what challenges do you think girls are facing in schools particularly and more specifically what do you think that schools could be doing but aren't doing to challenge them? Oh, um, well sexual harassment is it's widespread in school, there's no disputing that. Um, the statistics on the UK Feminist website a few years ago found that sexual harassment um, schools are the most common setting for sexual harassment worldwide. Um, it, I mean, it, it's, it's widespread and I, I find one of the hardest things is that talking to 
young women and older women now. Um, it's difficult to find women who don't have stories. Um, even if they're not personal, they'll know, well, this happened to my friend, this happened to my mother, this happened to my sister. Um, it's so hard to find somebody who doesn't have any experience at all of sexual harassment happening to women in their lives. Um, and I think it's so difficult to tackle in schools because there is a widespread lad culture um, which, is, which completely undermines the, like, um, the tackling of sexual harassment. I mean, we see in the media all the time, women are completely objectified. And um, n <laughs> when you have that kind of environment, it, it's really, really difficult to actually tackle such a serious issue. Um, and, but I think the problem is a lot of teachers don't know how to deal with sexual harassment. Um, they're not trained. They don't understand what to do if a student comes to them. Um, in my school, it was actually dealt with quite well, but I think it was a minority um, case because a lot of young a lot of young women wouldn't have even reported it, um, and I think that's a real problem because only 15% of sexual harassments are reported to the police, and it's like that. It, it goes unheard so many times and we need to challenge this culture which tells women that they can't speak out and that they shouldn't speak out because it's their fault um, for what's happening to them and that's just how it is. Thank you. Mila. Um, also, I think um, they need to start not like teaching children fully at a young age but if, because um, you said when you were 12 it happened, um, you probably that that's why it's so unreported because you probably wouldn't have known you were you must have been a bit confused about what it was because you weren't taught at a young age and I think um, people really do need to like be more open about that kind of thing and not try to hide it. Thanks. And I'm just going to ask you in a minute, but Mila, I want to come back to you because you said in your first speech that you. You know, you're only six months out of primary school and already you're worrying about Instagram and anorexia and body image. So how, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a secondary school teacher, so I'm not really aware precisely how young do you think this is starting and at what age should we be tackling these kind of issues towards body image and potentially also, I guess, sexual harassment? Um, well, I think in year seven, you suddenly go from primary school to secondary school and it's a lot more stress and, and then you have a lot of like um, stress from your friends and the other people in your year to look to look presentable for school and that's when it starts really because um, that's when most children join um, social media sites and they start finding out about that kind of thing and with all the stress and the and people telling them they should look better. It's, I think it's quite, un, it's quite an unhealthy thing and, and it starts then because you've, it's all piling up and you just don't really know what to do about it. And what would you like schools to, what would you like teachers to be able to, or schools to do about it, Mila? What, would, what do you think would support girls best? Um, raising more awareness and um, yeah, in, in classes maybe talk, having like a few times a year when you have to talk about issues about that like we have PSHE in my school but we mainly just talk about friendship problems we don't talk about anything like that and it's it's a really big problem and you they really need to they really need to teach it early on and have like once or twice or even once a week or once a month when they when students can talk about that to teachers and they can learn more about those subjects Thank you, Mila. Um, Anissa, you said in your speech that you felt that your school was really good at supporting girls. Um, could you say a little bit more, you know, what, what do they do, what more could they do, if anything, you know? Um, so in our school we have the Women's Education Department, which I think not many schools, when I look at them, have. And so what they do is they give us opportunities and help build us up and make us feel strong and empowered and sort of get us to become critical thinkers and you know like when we see something not just look at it and think this is what it is but sort of look at other possibilities and say well is this right is this wrong how do I feel about it so I think not many schools are doing that but I, because of the women's education department I feel that it's molded me to become the person I am today like 
I don't think if I went to another school I'd be able to sit on the panel at WOW and sort of tell everybody about my experiences and why I'm a feminist. So I think the women's education department plays a really, really big and important factor in my life because they've just helped me so much in finding who I am and sort of becoming my own person and saying no to what I think is wrong and yes to what I think is right and doing more to encourage that. Um, and so you've talked about about your schools. I just want to ask a little bit. Ooh, uh, I want to ask a little bit about your family as well. Um, are your families supportive of your feminism? And you know, is it is it fine to walk, for you to walk amongst an older generation in your communities and say, yeah, do you know what? I'm a feminist. I think my family is quite different to sort of the stereotypical Bengali Muslim family because, like. When people hear that my dad knows how to sew and my mum doesn't, they're a bit like, that's quite strange. And then my dad knows how to cook and so does my mum. And my dad knows how to clean and so does my mum. And my mum knows how to make a spreadsheet. So I think it's, we've got, we sort of have we sort of got like a balance in my family. And I think I'm so so fortunate to, be, to have been brought up in a family where men and women are equal, and sort of they see that and they acknowledge that and they and they feel that everyone should be like that. And as much as I'd love to say that every family is like that. Some of the things I've heard, it's not true. Although like people are moving forward and slowly, slowly we're building up to the idea that feminism is okay and there's still so much more that sort of women aren't getting their sort of getting to do what they want and stuff. Like in families I think when I was talking to someone earlier and they told me how when their mum cooks them dinner it's sort of like, okay good, food's yummy, great. And then sort of when it's their dad who cooks it's like, oh my God, wow, this is so nice. Thank you so much for making me dinner. You're so amazing. So I think it's just little things like that that make you realise that the world isn't perfect and we're still, we're still here when it comes to equality when we want to be all the way over there. So I think, yeah, it's not, we're not, we don't live in a perfect world, but I think my family are definitely helping me sort of spread awareness a bit more and realise that you need to be a person with integrity and sort of fight for what you believe in. Okay, thank you. I, I'm also interested uh, a little bit. You talked about Pippi Longstocking. I'm, I'm keen to know who are your role models in feminism? Um, obviously, Pippi Longstocking. Um, my parents actually quite a lot because I know they're not like famous or anything, but they do, they do influence me in feminism a lot and they encourage my beliefs and they kind of they nurture them and they help they help me aim for what I want and and just I don't have any specific other role models but I think anyone who fights for what they believe in and and who who wants to change the world. Um, I think I'm gonna kind of pick up on what you said, just people in ev everyday life. Um, if this question was asked me a year ago, I would probably would have listed off like a hundred Guardian journalists. Um, <laughs> maybe every journalist. Um, or like, um, you know, these amazing feminist figures, people have come before. Um, but now I just think it's the people in everyday life. Um, I mean, I, my family have been really supportive. Very lucky. <laughs> and. Uh, no more page three campaigners and people at college and just um, just taking inspiration from from people who fight for what they believe in all around because that's um, where it's most important. Um, I know I've mentioned my family before, but I think I just need to pick up on how amazing they are. Um, my my grandmother from both my mum and my dad's side they're just so strong-willed. I think. They make me want to be like them. I mean, they're old, but you see them like running around everywhere and doing everything like that. So I think they're just, they're such amazing, creative, funny women. And so they are what I want to be. And I think my mum and my dad, they've learned a lot from them. They're so lucky to have such amazing parents. And so I can tell that they're taking in what they say because sort of they bring me up saying that you need to be a good person. And so sort of it's not necessarily about what society is telling you is right but what you think is right and sort of standing up for that so I think anybody who does that in my in my I'd consider a role model I mean even my younger sisters they're younger than me but 
I think they're doing so much more than I did at their age. Like when they see bullying on the playground, they'd be like, no, stop it. <coughs> I would sort of shy away a bit. So I think definitely the people in my family, um, the women's education department at my school, people like Shanaz Begum and Miss Tuffy and Joe, who are just, oh, great. I, I think they, they really teach you the sort of similar things like stand up for what you believe in. And then sort of my older peers and my younger peers, like Promi and Maria and um, Anani and Nafisa, I mean, they're just, they're such amazing people. And I think, I keep bragging about my family and my school, but I can't get over the fact how amazing I've got it at the moment, having such, being surrounded by such amazing and fantastic people. Oh. So I know there's quite a few teachers in the audience, and I know that for lots of teachers, one of the big concerns as feminists, for those of us who are feminists, is how we can support girls with a lot of the new issues that are arising from kind of social media. You talked a bit about um, you know, the issues that come from Instagram, and <coughs> eating disorders. I know in my last school, before I taught at Mulberry, we had issues with um, explicit photographs being taken of students and being shared without their consent, or sexual harassment taking place on the internet, on Facebook, and us. And one of the key things that we found very difficult is that it, it's often not visible, you know, in, it's often not taking place in the classroom, it's taking place after school and on social media. What do you girls think that we can do to support young women with these issues that are clearly very serious and very prevalent? Um, I think with the issues like cyberbullying and um, that kind of thing, we should, there, I mean there are sites like Childline but sometimes people don't know about them and I think yeah we just we just really really need to raise more awareness of where you can go to get help because a lot of people do not know where to go and then they become really confused and and it's just it's not a good thing. I think education is the key um, not just educating young people but edu educating the whole of society, um, educating teachers about how to deal with um, issues if students do come to them, um, educating um, people as a whole um, that this is going on and that we need to do something about it, um, and educating um, young people um, because a lot of the time young people aren't aware that what they're doing um, especially at quite a young age, um, might be damaging or harmful. Um, people don't just decide to uh, be hurtful to other people. It's got to be influenced by something. Um, so it's, it's having a look at what is influencing um, people. Internet pornography, for example, is huge at the moment. And there is no way, no matter how many filters David Cameron tries to put on the internet, there is no way that we're ever going to stop people from, from having access to it. That's just... What, what is happening now. Um, so it's, it's all about talking, okay, so what, what kind of what perceptions is this giving you and um, how does it differentiate from real life? Um, and um, how, how do you just go, go about um, and take positive influences rather than negative ones? Yes, I want to come back to you. You mentioned that you, your heroes, your role models at the No More Page 3 campaign. I think yeah. you're wearing a No More Page 3 t-shirt. Advertising the campaign. Um, so could you say a little bit about what that is and if you, why you think it's especially important for young women? Well, the No More Page 3 campaign was set up um, just over a year, about a year and a half ago, um, by Lucy Ann Holmes because she was reading The Sun um, for sports coverage, it was during the Olympics, um, and um, she found that the picture of the page three model was bigger than the image of Jessica Ennis, who had just won a gold medal um, for Great Britain, and uh, it's sort of this, um, sort of hit her at that point, that um, an image of a woman in her knickers um, was more um, recognised in Britain's biggest selling family newspaper than an image of a woman who had actually achieved something and it's basically saying um, we recognise you for what you look like not what you do. It's all about your appearance um, not your actions and not your qualities as, as a human being um, and this is obviously sexist um, <laughs> so it's <laughs> She set up a petition, and now there's a team of us um, who all work really, really 
passionately on the campaign. Um, and a lot of people, I mean, it, it's to do with a wider culture of media sexism um, that encourages this. It's not just page three, it's, it's basically everything, which is quite a depressing thought. <laughs> but um, we need to start somewhere. And page three is a very important place to start because it is a family newspaper. And that is something that's very influential um, in society. So um, it, it's looking at tackling that issue um, because page three and wider media sexism does affect women on a day-to-day -day basis. It affects um, men's views of women. It affects women's views of themselves. And um, if we can tackle that issue, then hopefully we can move to, towards a more equal society. Also, I think that kind of thing um, just it shows a really unhealthy image of women and it's like a surreal image because it's obviously the photos are photoshopped and like little kids who read the sun over their parents' shoulder or something come away with that idea that that's what women are supposed to look like and yeah that is and like for example my um one of the people i know he's like he's like nine and he brought um page three to school to show off about it and i just think it's not it's not acceptable that that there are things out there showing women that they're not perfect and they are perfect they're perfect just how they are and So obviously Marlborough is a school where the majority of the girls are Muslim and, and wear hijab so the sexualisation of women in the media might play out, do you think it plays out differently or do you think it plays out in exactly the same way as it would in any other school that has the same effect? I think at the end of the day we're all women so when you see another woman being portrayed like that in the media it's bound to anger you and I think that's one of the reasons why I went on to study media for GCSEs because I'm just so, so fascinated about how women we've made this huge movement how it's been like less than 100 years since we've got the vote and then look at this there's women naked on a newspaper for men's entertainment or you know, people's entertainment and I think what is this saying to society and what is this saying to young girls I mean I've got four younger sisters who are going to grow up and I don't want them to sort of feel like it's all based on their looks and not who they are and they're anything but perfect because in reality I've been taught that perfect is exactly what you are and you need to sort of express that as much as you can. So I feel like definitely sort of the media plays such a huge part in how young girls feel about themselves. And in primary school, I think it needs to be addressed more because people assume that they're young children, so all they really worry about is playing and sort of what color crayon they're gonna use next. But I think it's more than that. And I see it in my younger sisters, sort of, they, they're already starting to feel a bit self-conscious about themselves and there's no one there to remind them that what they are is okay. and so there's no such thing as one idea of perfect, but millions and billions of ideas of what perfection is and sort of what they are is perfect and it's all right to feel that way. So I think it definitely needs to start from primary school because I remember I wasn't really taught about what feminism was and what being a feminist is. So when it came to sort of being my first year of secondary, I was a bit, I was a bit shy of the word feminism, but then Morby taught me to sort of embrace it. And it's not bad, it's something good. and. You need to like stand up for these people. So I think it definitely needs to be taught from a younger age. Like just even little things like when a boy snatches a crayon or from a girl or a girl snatches a crayon from a boy, like that is not okay. And you need to understand that we're gonna all be living together in this society. And if you're if sort of you're saying it's okay from a younger age, then what's to say that when a man rapes a woman 20 years later, that it's okay it's not okay. So definitely. Yes. You brought up the idea of rape, and I know that one of the things that our that teachers have been concerned about is hearing the word rape used very casually in the classroom. People talk about Facebook rape when people have logged into somebody else's Facebook account, um, and things being a bit rapey. And it, it, I think one of the concerns that as teachers, my many of my colleagues have is that rape is being 
uh, sort of downplayed if rape is being compared to somebody, you know, writing a status on your Facebook wall, does this mean that rape is something that's not being taken seriously amongst young people in your generation? Uh, yes. Well, um, towards the end of my secondary school life, um, I started um, counting the amount of times I, I would hear rape jokes or rapes used the word rape used in a casual context during the day. Um, and it was rarely used for any other context um, in the school environment. Um, and I found that I would hear at least three comments a day. Um, made me quite obviously upset. Um, and I, ju I just find that this very casual use of the word rape completely degrades um, how horrific it is. Um, and it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I think as a culture, that is something that we really, really need to address because at the moment, hardly anything is being done about it. And, it, and it's happening three times a day, you know, in school and nothing, you know, there, there are no repercussions for this. Um, and it's something that we really need to tackle and actually say, hang on a second, this is completely unacceptable. Um, and we're not doing it at the moment. And I think the best way to do that is through education and through a, a wider cultural change. Um, well, um, when I was in my primary school, it was mixed. And um, there was this thing that all the boys used to do, and it was called the rape face. And it was just this comedy face that like KSI did or something on YouTube. And I didn't actually find it funny because it was about a serious thing and these people weren't informed about it so they were using it as comedy and people should not be promoting that and things like Snapchat, people do that on Snapchat and Skype and um, we, I think children need to be more informed about what that means and so they don't end up as adults not knowing what it is and, and not not knowing how to deal with it. Um, the last thing that I want to ask you about is about aspirations because it's well it's sort of well known in the <coughs> teachers that girls do better at GCSEs than boys and they do better at A levels than boys. But there are fewer girls than boys in our top universities. And if we look at the FTSE 100 and the 100 biggest companies in the UK, only two of them are led by women currently, possibly three actually, I think it's two. Um, so why do you think that, and some people speculate that that is because girls don't think that they can hold these high positions of power and so that they never really aim for them. They never really have these big aspirations, whereas boys do. Um, and I wanted to know if that was your experience, or if it's not, what do you think the reasons are that women, overall, are not achieving this, these kind of high levels of success with the same regularity that men are? Um, I think it's because they don't have enough confidence in themselves, and, and they're not, their confidence isn't being, like, helped. And... Um, a lot of the girls I know, they all say like they want to be pop stars because that's quite a feminine thing to do. And the boys are all like, uh, well, in my old school, some boys were aiming to be bankers, and and the girls were were, were just like, oh, I want to be a pop star, I want to be an actress, because they're seen seen as feminine things. And maybe that's the reason because they're, they're these stere stereotypical things that that higher jobs are originally for boys, and that should not be the case at all. That should not be the case. Um, well, I think that in terms of the future, I mean, you never really know where it's going to go, but I think we're definitely on the right track at the moment because I see so many inspirational women around me doing such amazing things like Jennifer Lawrence and Demi Lovato. They talk about sort of how being a pop star isn't, or an actress or whatever, it's not just sort of what you see, there's a lot more behind it and there's a lot more underneath it. And so they're raising awareness for things like bulimia and anorexia and sort of Jennifer Lawrence, I think it was her who said that she'll never lose weight for any role. And it's just when you hear stuff like that, it just makes you feel a little bit more comfortable with who you are. 
and sort of makes you think, well, they feel so strong and empowered in what they do. I want to feel like that in whatever I do. So I think girls just need to be pushed a bit more to, and sort of told that it's all right if they want to be like a CEO or sort of the prime minister one day because it's there's not. I don't think there's any such thing as a man's job or a woman's job or a man's role or a woman's role. So I think we can we play it equally, and I think a woman can be just as good a doctor or a banker or a lawyer as any man. So I think it's just about pushing them a bit more and making them feel. Like it's okay to aspire high and dream high because you're just as capable and as any man out there. So I think just making them a bit more aware of who they are, helping them find themselves and feeling a lot more comfortable in, in their skin. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, it's, quite, it's a bit of a vicious circle because um, society reflects the media and the media reflects society. Um, so it, it's quite difficult um, when you don't have um, females in high positions um, to then go and tell young girls, well, this is attainable for you, because they're like, oh, where's the proof? Um, <laughs> um, and you don't see women in the media represented um, that well. Um, but then that's because the m media is reflecting a society in which um, young women can't go out and achieve as well as men, but that's because the media have put them down. So it's like this really vicious cycle. The thing is, you can't just flick a switch and change society and change societal attitudes. And you can't really do that with the media either, but it's a lot easier to change the media than it is to change society. So if we kind of start changing the media and putting more women into the media, that will help influence um, a widespread change in the rest of society. So. It's not that easy, but it's it's what we kind of need to aim for, I think, hopefully. So can I just follow up on that? You think because that's what women see is in the media, what girls see is in the media, if that was different, if it was a different portrayal, they would have different aspirations. Was that, yeah. yeah, I mean, there, there was a quote in um, Misrepresentation, the US documentary, um, uh, you can't be what you can't see. Um, and I think that's really important. Like, if young girls, if you're saying to young girls, you can do this, but then they look out and they can't see any evidence of any un other young women who have achieved it, how are they supposed to feel that they can achieve it? So, one of the things that I'm quite interested in, and again, Mulberry is very much the exception in, to the rule in this case, as in so many ways, but if you look at most schools, the majority of junior teaching staff will be women, and the majority of head the vast majority of head teachers nationally, and even deputy head teachers are male. Do you think that that kind of imbalance in schools is also create, you know, creates unfair aspiration? Or what, what am I trying to say? Rather, that sort of diminishes girls' aspirations about what they can achieve. Yeah, it definitely contributes to it because it's part of a hierarchy that's present in all of society that men are at the top and women um, get the less well-paid jobs or the, the jobs that are seen as less important um, and men get the jobs running and um, making the ultimate decisions. Thank you. Is there anyone who, do any of you want to say anything? Either? I've got like a kind of smaller scale example of that. Um, I really like um, street dance and it's kind of a big part of my life but I find when I go to like competitions and even in my street dance class, it's mainly made up, made up of boys and they get to choose a lot of the stuff and yeah, that's like a really small example, but that's... Yeah. Cool. I think it's an important one, thank you. Okay. Oh, oh, you don't have to answer, I was just saying... Okay. I um, have... I think I was saying, why is it, do you think that girls don't aspire in the same way? Do you think that the way that schools are structured affects that? But obviously in our school, the school where we teach, women occupy many of the most powerful positions. And do you think that it's like helps to inspire you, the fact that you can see in your school that the structure supports women reaching the very top? Okay, um, I think I've got friends who go to mixed schools, so when I talk to them, it's like, it's a lot different to talking to my friends at Marlborough who are like, really confident and sort of, sorry, really confident and out there and comfortable with who they are. And I think it's because in many mixed schools, girls are sort of overshadowed by boys and they feel like, especially in subjects like drama and music, that like, it's not really made for them because they can't be confident. 
and they're not happy with who they are. So I think it's it sort of girls need to be pushed out there a bit more sort of shine and be in the limelight because I think when the girls hear about sort of the opportunities I have in my school they're like oh my god that's so cool and they, I don't think they realise the opportunities they have and they need to be more made more aware of that and sort of be taught that you know you're great and just be happy like that and I think it was um, Lupita from I, I don't know if you guys have heard of her from 12 Years a Slave I've just written the quote down somewhere um, she's she basically said that when she was younger she never really she was never happy with her skin colour and it was her mother who said that beauty is something you can't eat. So beauty isn't something sustainable, but things that are is qualities like kindness and confidence and accepting who you are and being happy with that. And I think more young women and more women just need to take that on board and understand that it's not about necessarily what's physical, but sort of what's underneath all of that and sort of being happy and kind and sort of spreading that a bit more around.